Okay, so it's just about 12 o'clock. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a deeper dive into the data and analysis of Cities Outlook 2021. On Monday this week, we launched the 14th edition of Cities Outlook, which is the only annual comprehensive economic analysis of urban Britain. As I said on Monday each year, as well as providing lots of economic facts and figures on the country's 63 biggest cities and towns, we look at a particular issue in more detail. And surprisingly this year, we focus on the impact of COVID and the, the impact that it's had on the economies of our cities and towns. And how this uh, has, and indeed will, influence the government's leveling up agenda. For those of you that were with us on a Monday, you'll recall that my colleague Paul gave a very brief overview of the Outlook's findings and the implications for policy. And today, Paul and my colleague Eleanor are going to get under the skin of the report, explore the data and the analysis in much more detail, what we did, why we did it, what we found and what it means, and then we'll take questions uh, from you. But before we start, as always, the event is going to be recorded. It'll be made available uh, along with the slides on our website after the event. During the event, please keep your microphones on mute. If you want to tweet about the event, the hashtag is CitiesOutlook21. There will be opportunities for questions to Paul and Eleanor after they've presented. You can submit your questions at any time. You don't have to wait until they've finished. And you can do that via the chat function on the channel, ask a question. Um, when we get to questions, we do like you to ask your questions, so be prepared. But if you would prefer me to read it out, then that's fine as well. So just let us know when you post your question uh, that you'd like me to read it out rather than yourself. And we will be done by one o'clock. So, as I've said, let's get cracking. So to kick us off, my colleague Eleanor McGraney, who's the senior analyst at the centre, is going to look at the detail of the analysis, uh, particularly to explore how COVID and uh, levelling up interact. Following Eleanor, Paul Swinney, Centre's Director for Policy and Research, is going to give an overview of our new City Monitor data tool, which provides loads of data uh, on the country's biggest cities and towns. Uh, and they'll talk for about 25 minutes and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So, Elena, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. And thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, this morning. Measuring and understanding uh, what is happening on the ground uh, in different places has never been straightforward, but definitely the pandemic has made this uh, even more challenging. What I want to do this morning with you is uh, to show how we went about uh, uh, measuring the interaction between COVID-19 and leveling up uh, in different places. And hopefully this will provide insight for everyone who is interested in uh, going about uh, trying to answer um, similar questions. Um, before I do that, uh, let's get uh, definition uh, straight first. Um, leveling up. Um, leveling up is... Uh, um, can you see your, my slides change, moving on? All right. Because they're not moving on my screen at all. Okay. Um, now you can see them. Leveling up. The government has uh, um, talked a lot about leveling up. He has been elected on the pledge of uh, leveling up parts of the country, but he has uh, yet to, to define what it means uh, in terms of measuring this uh, uh, economic concept. There is consensus about what it means uh, with leveling up. The government wants to improve the economic performance of parts of the country that are underperforming, in particular in the North and the Midlands. But as I said, um, it's not very clear yet as how he wants to um, measure this uh, leveling up challenge. As our core mission at Centre for Cities uh, is uh, to uh, improve and understand the economic performance on cities and large towns across the country, we have uh, 15 years of experience in trying to measure what leveling up uh, is. Uh, and we, we've done so even before the government started talking about leveling up. We've done so using a number of different indicators. What you see on the screen now is uh, just one example of a report that we published last year in, uh, um, on this topic. And uh, uh, we use a wealth of indicator on a number of different uh, topics. Um, and Paul will talk more about it in uh, his presentation later on. 
Uh, but while uh, uh, there are a lot of great indicators available uh, to study uh, local economies, not many of them are timely. And yet the pandemic doesn't wait as uh, year on year to see how things have changed. Things in the last 12 months change very quickly, month by month. So then when we try to um, look at the impact of the pandemic on different labor markets and its interaction with uh, um, the leveling up agenda, we were left uh, with uh, one indicator that we thought uh, was uh, particularly useful and particularly good in uh, trying to capture what was happening in different labor markets and that was the claim and count. Now we are very aware that the claim and count is not an official measure of unemployment and uh, that's because uh, some people who are unemployed do not qualify for benefits whereas some others are in work but do qualify for uh, benefits. Um, uh, benefits. Um, but uh, uh, what we know about uh, the claim and count is that it is positively related with other official measures of uh, um, ways to measure the labour market. It is available at small geographies, which means uh, that we can see comparison in between how different places are faring, uh, whereas most of the data that is available currently is national level otherwise. It is administrative data, which means it doesn't have any of the downsides of sample size that other uh, surveys, for example, have and it is a timely indicator. We can get uh, the latest figures were out for example on Tuesday and that gave us indications uh, for December. So as a measure of leveling up in terms of how we wanted to define it for this report we chose to use the claim and count as the baseline and in terms of how we define the leveling up we decided that the best way to encapsulate what leveling up could have meant in March last year would have been to bring the claim and count rate of parts of the countries that were above the national average in line with the national average of March 2020. So in March 2020, the UK had a claim and count rate of 3%. And what we wanted to see was that every local authority with a claim and count above this 3% to be in line with this national average. On this graph, you can see what that means in practice for the, three, uh, for the 63 largest cities and towns. 36 of them had an above average uh, claim and count rate, so they had a leveling up challenge in March. And that is uh, identified in this graph by the dark green bars. What we would want to see, what we would have wanted to see in March, was for every city to instead have a claim and count rate that was just the light green bars. Now, Fast forward 10 months, the pandemic kicks in, things have changed very rapidly, and rather than seeing an improvement of any place on any of this measure, we have seen uh, the situation getting much worse everywhere across the country. Um, this is this, exactly the same graph as I show you just now, but rather than showing the claim and count rate in March 2020, this shows you the same claim and count rate, but in November 2020. The light green bars are exactly the same as before. They represent where we would like to see places to be in a level up to Britain. The dark green bars are exactly the same as before. They are the leveling up challenge. But now every place also has a pandemic effect, a pandemic challenge represented by the purple bars. These bars show the increase in the claim and count rate in between March and November. What can you see here? Well, first, every place now has a claim and count rate that is above the national average in March. You can see that places have been hit hard um, on this measure. And uh, uh, when you calculate uh, what this actually means in uh, hard numbers, you can see that the leveling up challenge has become four times harder than it was before because the places that needed to level up before the pandemic are now even farther away from the national average. And then in addition to that, what you can see based on the distributions of the col colors across the graph is that uh, the leveling up challenge is not anymore towards the top of the graph uh, on the left hand side, but is spread around. Uh, whereas instead places that didn't have a leveling up challenge before, places like Slough and Crawley and London, are now among uh, the top bars. So the places that now have the highest claim and count rate are not necessarily the places that had the biggest leveling up challenge before the pandemic. Some of them instead used to be prosperous places and this creates an additional challenge, a second challenge uh, created by the pandemic and that is the risk of leveling places down. Now this is a snapshot of what has happened already in the labour market um, as of November but things could be much worse. 
The government has been extremely helpful uh, with the, the introduction of the um, coronavirus job retention scheme in protecting jobs and livelihood, livelihoods across the country. Uh, people have been able to uh, uh, protect their earnings thanks to the scheme. And uh, the, uh, this, has been, uh, this has been good throughout the pandemic because it has prevented a rise in unemployment. However, the scheme is set to be phased out at the end of April, and we, that will coincide with the rise in unemployment. Where could we see the biggest rises in unemployment? Well, we can reasonably think that the places that have been more reliant on the coronavirus job retention schemes will also be the places uh, experiencing um, or potentially more vulnerable to uh, experience uh, largest increases in the, claim, in the claim and count figures. So that would be the top two quadrants uh, in this graph. So um, places like Crawley, places like Edinburgh, places like London have more people on the coronavirus job retention scheme, so potentially could be more vulnerable to further increases in unemployment. Now, however, there is also another measure that we need to consider, and that is uh, why different places are facing the challenges they're facing because of the pandemic. And one of the key elements of the pandemic is that it has meant that many more people have changed the way in which they use the city. For example, they no longer travel to work, uh, but they work from home. And we know that um, that means uh, that uh, in some places, um, even more people are on the coronavirus job retention scheme, and that is because workers are not spending time in the city centre, and that has a knock-on effect on the businesses around the city centre. And that would be particularly the case for places like Cardiff, London and Edinburgh in the top right quadrant. Whereas instead, in other places like Crawley, Luton and Slough, there is less of this issue and more just a very high take up of the government retention scheme. So then when we consider all together these factors, the ability of people to work from home or not, the take up of the job retention scheme in different places and the claim and count before and after the pandemic, we can then categorize places into four big groups based on the kind of challenges they're facing because they're facing different challenges. On one end, we have the places that are, um, let's say in the most vulnerable situation right now, these are places like Birmingham, Blackpool or Bradford, for example, which had a big leveling up challenge before the pandemic. And uh, they have since faced a big COVID challenge too. Their uh, activities in their cities have been disproportionately affected by uh, the pandemic. And that comes on top of an already weak uh, economic performance. Then on the other end, we have some places that have a leveling up challenge, but instead have been relatively sheltered by the events of the past 10 months. These are places like uh, Mansfield, Middlesbrough or Barnsley, for example. And for these places, we can be more confident that they will be able to bounce back from COVID more quickly. But the challenge they're facing is the level they're bouncing back to. They had a pretty weak economic performance before the pandemic, and the policy response in these places needs to focus on improving this economic performance. Then we have uh, cities that had strong economies before the pandemics. This again can be split into two groups. On one end, some of them have been hit quite badly by the pandemic, as we've seen in, earlier in the graph, places like Slough, Crawley and London. These places have on their side the fact that they entered the pandemic in a strong economic position, but they're now facing a big, big pandemic challenge, economic challenge created by the pandemic. And then lastly, we have a group of cities, places like Reading or Oxford or, or Milton Keynes, for example, that used to be strong economies before the pandemic and are among the places that have been least affected by the events of the past 10 months. So all in all, what this shows is that different places uh, are in very different positions right now. And therefore, what it means, it also means that, that they need different policy responses. Which brings me to my last slides about what needs to change in terms of helping every place to bounce back from COVID and grow in the longer term. Now, the recommendations that we have here are broader than just about uh, the claim and count or the job retention schemes, which are the two measures uh, that we used in this report, but they are reflective of uh, the wealth of work that we have been doing in the past uh, 10 years in terms of what it means uh, um, to level up different parts of the country. And uh, it kind of will fit nicely with the uh, post presentations in a second. But before moving on to that, 
what, what needs to change? In the short term, we need to make sure that people that are on universal credit can keep uh, the permanent increase uh, that has been uh, granted throughout the pandemic. So, so we need to keep the uplift um, for uh, universal credit for everyone who is um, ben benefiting from um, these claims and is made redundant. Then we also need to make sure that the follow scheme continues for as long as there are social restrictions in place to prevent even more people to lose their jobs. And then when things will be safer and it will be um, safer to go out and spend again, we need to ensure that we have measures that help that encourage people to go out and spend once more. Then in terms of leveling up, it is not about bouncing back. We need to ensure that this time round places get the right tools to be able to uh, promote economic growth in the longer term. And that means a number of interventions on multiple fronts. For example, investing in further education and supporting job creation, helping cities and large towns becoming more attractive to businesses, such as by investing in their city centers and investing in transport infrastructures, as well as uh, pressing on with devolution and ensuring the powers are closer uh, to the local economies. So that's it from me. Thank you. And I'm going to now hand over to Paul. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. Uh, what I'm going to do now is show you our new data tool. So. Those of you who are familiar with Cities Outlook will be uh, aware of the uh, the hallmark of Cities Outlook, which was the, the back end of it, which gave a, a top 10 and bottom 10 of tables of a whole host of economic indicators that we can use to try and measure the performance of, of our largest cities and towns across the country. So that ranged from things like industrial structure through to um, and environmental issues around carbon dioxide emissions through to you know, other types of things that, that you don't look at around business stock, number of businesses created, et cetera, et cetera. So a really broad uh, element of, uh, of variables used to give that as, as broad a picture as possible to understand uh, all of our economies across the country. Now, we haven't done that this year. Um, instead, we've, uh, we, we didn't do chapter three, or, sorry, we've actually changed chapter three to being a, a digital tool that you can access at any point and make it interactive as well to get all of that information out that you need. The point of it is to be, you know, the place hopefully for you to go if you're looking at trying to get information on on any city that you're looking at because it'll have such a broad range of variables. Um, but also we want to give you information at a glance too, so you can very quickly get a feeling for how well or not a city may be performing by looking across these different variables. So what does the tool look like? Let me give you a demonstration on that. So it sits on our website. Um, it is at setofcities.org and then forward slash city dash monitor. But if you actually go on the homepage and click on the Cities Outlook page, you'll be able to find it from there as well by clicking explore the data. And what you'll be showing is, is the following. First page. So there are three tabs and I'm going to run you through the first one first. This one, the overview tab, gives you an overview of, of all of those indicators that we're talking about to give you a very visual and, and quick sense about how quickly a place is performing. So if you look up here at this, this national um, starburst, as I like to, to call them, what you can see here is lots of different indicators going around the sides, grouped into different um, into categories. So for example, number of people who are subscribed to a, a certain speed of broadband, um, population change over a 10 year period, um, ratio of public to private sector jobs, you know, the three variables that are on there. And then you've got these dots. And what the dots represent is the relative performance of different places. So it represents the ranking that they, that they are placed relative to other cities in for one particular measure. So if they do very well, they're towards the end, they're towards number one. If they do very poorly, they're towards the other end, into the middle of the, of the star. They're the sort of, you know, performing sort of 59, 60th, 61st, um, 62nd out of the ranking you know, towards the bottom. So it's very much this relative nature of how you're performing compared to other cities. Now we've got the national starburst here, but if you were to scroll down, you would see it for every individual place, and it gives it, so it gives you that that visual, um, a visual, very visual uh, view of how well a city is performing. What you can then do, however, is because we're presenting data there for all 63 cities, is start to dig down and say, well, actually, I'm only really interested in comparing a certain number of cities. So we've got our uh, predefined. Uh, categories here. So we've got different regions of the UK. You can select cities within each region, or you could select the 10 biggest cities as, as a suggestion. But also you can customize your group as well. So you can actually select the cities that you want. So let's pick two cities. Let's pick out uh, Dundee. So I type in Dundee like that, it will come up. And let's also compare that then to Reading. If we click apply, then you'll see um, these two cities pop up. 
And I've picked these two places because I think they're a really good illustration of how well these starbursts work to give you that, that visual um, view of what's going on. So if you look at Reading, first off on the right hand side, you can see here that the majority of its dots are towards the very end of those starbursts. Oh, it's performing very well on, um, uh, on a range of different indicators. Um, across the board, you know, it's on for this one. Number of people have high level skills. It's uh, it's seven out of sixty three. This one here, number of people claiming uh, job seekers allowance or as was so the claimant count now. Um, it's six out of sixty three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You get the, a good idea, and it's doing very well on all those indicators. Now, as you can see there, there were two where it isn't performing so well, and it's actually at the opposite end of the scale um, in terms of performance. So let's see what they are. Well, first is housing affordability. It's got some of the most expensive houses relative to wages across any of the cities in the UK. It's 55 out of the, the 62 that we have data for on that measure. And the second one is, is air pollution. It's number of days of a year with, with poor air quality. And you can see there again, it's 52nd out of the 63 cities that we look at. So that's a, a bit of a contrast there in terms of doing very well on most, but actually those are two indicators not doing so well. Let's now look to, uh, to Dundee to see the contrast. Well, you can see there actually it's, it's almost sort of the, the mirror opposite of what's going on in Reading. And that for the majority of indicators, you can see that they're actually closer towards the middle of the, of the star, suggesting that they're not before, it's not performing particularly well on a, on a whole range of economic indicators. But there are two that jump out that actually are where it's doing very well on. First one is how it has the affordability. It's 9th out of 62. Second one is air pollution, where it's doing very well. Again, it's got the second, had the second best performance in terms of air pollution out of all the cities that um, that we look at. What this is telling us is that, you know, in a very sort of quick and visual sense, that there's a very different policy approach that's required for Reading as compared to Dundee. The challenge in Dundee is about trying to get its economy going. How can we make interventions to try and make it more prosperous, try and make it more productive, to try and attract in um, more jobs, but also better paid jobs too, to put more money in people's pockets. And that's where the focus has to be on is in terms of actually getting its economy started. In Reading, the challenge is the opposite. We don't need to get Reading's economy going, notwithstanding perhaps a little bit of help to recover from COVID, because we've got very, very strong economic performance across the board. So actually sort of making interventions there to actually make it stronger or, or to, to get its economy going are just not needed. That isn't to say that you don't require intervention into Reading. The issue that Reading faces is not about, as I say, getting its economy going, but actually dealing with the costs of growth dealing with the fallout from very, having very high demand for businesses and people to want to be within it. And you can see that then there in terms of how it manifests itself, in terms of very expensive housing and poor air quality because of the amount of, of activity that's going on within it. And so those policies around dealing with the cost of growth, congestion, housing, pollution, are exactly the sorts of things we were thinking for for Reading, which is a very different approach as to what's required in Dundee. And hopefully this original representation gives you a very quick, um, quick sight on that. So that's the first tab, the overview tab. If we then click on the table view, we'll get perhaps a slightly more traditional view of, of how we might look at some of these indicators. So because I've selected two cities, we only see two cities uh, turn up here, but actually if we selected them more, if we hadn't selected any cities, we'd see the full list of the 63 cities. But to keep it easy, I'll keep it on, uh, on these two cities to start off with. The, uh, the, def the default selection here is housing. So you can see we've got a number of different indicators that fall under housing. You can see how um, affordability has changed over time and see how house prices have changed over time, how the number of houses has changed over time as well in these two places. And we've also got the number of homes sold too. So you can see here how transactions have changed since January 2020 and how that fall off during COVID, but actually it's recovered back somewhat as, um, as the housing market has started to recover from the impact of COVID. You can see for Dundee, the data is not available because we don't have that for Scotland. We only have this indicator for England and Wales, and that's what appears when the data doesn't exist. But there are a number of different categories you can then select. You know, all of this data sort of is reflective of what's in the starburst. And there's actually some extra data in there too for you to have a play around with. You can see all the categories there, so employment, skills, earnings, you can select um, whichever ones you're interested in. Um, but we've also created this one, which is a COVID impact um, variable too, or selection of variables too, which indicate is that we think are telling us something about the impact of COVID um, over time. So if you're particularly interested in that, you can go in and, and look at this and it's giving you the latest data on that. So things that are included in that are things like a claim account rate, um, housing affordability ratio in house prices and the number of homes sold um, as well. Um, you, look, you can play around with that and understand what that looks like. You can share this on social media. 
And you can also press the download the data to uh, button, which will download all the data that is available on the website, not just the stuff that you're, you're seeing currently. So you can have all that data with just a click of a button. Finally, if we go on to the third tab, city profiles. This takes us into a, uh, into a more detailed view of what's going on within a particular city. So you can see here, um, Aberdeen is the, uh, is the default city. Um, and if you scroll down, you can see that it's got all these different uh, indicators uh, shown for Aberdeen. Uh, so you've got the starburst at the top, and then you've got um, population, how that's changed over time, and you've got how that measures up to uh, national change as well, which is the black dot. And as you can scroll down, you can see that we've got uh, different variables under the different sections, like business dynamics, like employment, and that's shown for all the data that we have available for, um, for the, your particular city that we've selected, and all the way down to industrial structure there. If you wanted to select another city, that's easy. You just select the, uh, the drop down bar there. Let's go and say, I don't know, let's pick Liverpool, for example. And you can then see sort of the starburst appearing and all the data appearing for Liverpool, as well as crucially the definition that we use for our different cities as well. And you can see that Liverpool is Liverpool plus Norsley local authorities. The final thing you can do of, of, uh, of interest on this uh, selection is you can send, start to compare to, to different cities as well. So if we were going to pick, I don't know, perhaps let's pick somewhere at random like Manchester, for example, completely at random, obviously. You can see there then all of a sudden we can start to compare uh, those two places so the starburst go together um, and then all the different indicators you can see that we've got the comparisons in the different columns there so business dynamics for liverpool business dynamics for manchester etc etc all the way down so you can get that again that visual uh, idea about how those two cities perform so that's the data tool um, let's say it's freely available on the website. We want it to be the, the go-to place that you go to if you are interested in city data. We want to try, we try to make it as comprehensive as possible and as visually engaging as possible too. We're very, uh, very keen to get feedback, but also please, uh, after this presentation, do go in, have a, have a play with it and come back to us with any questions that you have. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Paul, and indeed, uh, Eleanor. Uh, we've had quite a few questions in already. Uh, some uh, asking for a bit more explanation on certain issues uh, and then other questions in relation to have you thought about this or have you thought about that or have we done work on this or have we done work on that which will uh, will come to us. as I said um, unless you've specified otherwise we encourage you to ask your own um, question uh, that is not the case some have said uh, can I ask them for you which I, I will do um, but we have we had a couple of questions on on this one, and it's to do with was well, to do with two things. One is to do with inequality, uh, and secondly, it's to do with not just inequality between places, but inequality within places. Um, so I'm going to ask Agnieszka uh, Kaminska. I apologise, Agnieszka, if I, I've just completely messed your name up. If you're on the call, can you unmute and just ask your question around uh, inequalities to Paul, and then Paul and Eleanor will respond. Anishka. Um, absolutely. Thank you very much. And you pronounced my name perfectly. So <laughs> thanks for that. Um, I I was wondering um, when Elena was presenting um, uh, her presentation, I was wondering whether you thought of including some kind of quality so, or poverty measure in your in your index. Um, and um, yeah, what's the like? What's the idea? Um, what, what's the position of Center for Cities on, on that? Do you think that that would be desirable, or maybe maybe difficult, or maybe not? You didn't want to. Um, yeah, thanks. Great, thank you very uh, much. It's a great question, uh, and we do uh, care about it uh, deeply. So I, I'm not going to go any further than that. Paul, why didn't you say? Why didn't you kick us off on it? We've done various bits of work on this and then Eleanor can uh, can join in and add more. It's a great question and so the, the, the short answer is yes we care very much about uh, about those sorts of things. The issue comes in terms of trying to measure it is where we start to have a problem. So what we've done in the past is we've constructed a, a, a Gini coefficient which is what tends to be used to, to compare different countries in terms of how unequal they are and we applied that to cities now, we've used that in Cities Outlook in the past, but the ONS hasn't updated the data in order to allow us to, to look at that in more detail. Um, so we've got sort of a bit of a challenge there in terms of how best to try and, and represent that. But I think in, in Eleanor's work in particular, it, in terms of this year, we are, we are implicitly capturing a degree of, of inequality or measuring of it, or certainly people at the bottom of the labour market anyway, because the, you only qualify to, to claim universal credit um, 
if you're middle employed, if you're towards the bottom of the labour market, that you haven't got very, very many savings, for example. And so people who are high skilled, high paid, who are made uh, unemployed, are unlikely to show up in the claim account statistics as a result. So there's an element of that which is built in, but it is implicit rather than explicit. Uh, Eleanor, uh, you've done uh, plenty of work, not least uh, uh, last year, looking at um, uh, under the report title Opportunity Knock. So let's just say something about, you know, more broadly how we might get at issues around um, inequality between but also within places. Yes, and, um, and I mean, now we talk about the headline findings uh, for the report uh, and we focus on the difference between places, but within even cities out of chapter two this year, we look, for example, at inequalities within place, for example, by looking at the case for London, the claim account in London overall is uh, in, was in line with national average to begin with, and it showed up quite a lot since the pandemic. There are huge differences within the, the, the capital in itself uh, that we showed in the report with some some boroughs in particular are having the highest uh, increases in claim and count rates across the country. So uh, there's something in there. And then more generally in our work, yes, uh, we, we, we do try to, we do care about inequalities and we do try to capture um, as much as we can with the data that is available. And uh, uh, one of the things that we found is that uh, um, the places that um, tend to be more successful are also the places that tend to be more unequal. But that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing because as part of the research that we have done last year, especially with Opportunity Knox, what we found is that precisely in these stronger economies, uh, people towards the bottom end of the labor market are more likely to have more job opportunities, are more likely to be in work and to earn higher wages. So that was a report that we got out, I think it was in March 2018, uh, but it's definitely an area of research that we will continue to work on uh, in the coming years. Very good, thank you very much. Um, we've had several questions around this sort of theme uh, Paul, get, get you to respond, because it's a specific uh, question in relation to housing affordability, but I think it touches on this bigger point that actually where Eleanor started, which is about how you can get timely insight on what's going on and how then that relates to sort of the historical performance when we look back through time on, on data. And this is a question from uh, Vladimir Epuri. Uh, again, apologies, Vladimir, if, if I've done your name justice an injustice, but you've, you've asked me to ask your question, which is, how would Paul assess the COVID impact on housing affordability ratio based on the shown chart, given that the yearly data are being displayed? And obviously, we're looking backwards in time uh, uh, and COVID happened in, uh, in the very near future where it's actually happening uh, as we speak. So, Paul, just say something about, about that, because it reveals some challenges about understanding what's going on in real time at the local level. Yes, it points exactly to the issue, I think, of of, uh, of data availability and how best we can measure the, the ongoing uh, nature of the pandemic, which is a frustration we have, I think, as, as researchers, as well as, you know, trying to, people are trying to come up with policy to respond to it. So in terms of, uh, of housing data, the great news about the housing data is that it is, um, we do just come out more frequently. And so that's why we've got the transactions data in particular, where you can really see that pattern going on. But of course, in terms of affordability, it becomes a bit more of a challenge um, because wages aren't released as frequently. Um, the issue we've got with wage data in particular is not only is it um, not as good as what it could be, um, but it doesn't come out really fully either, which then makes the job of trying to understand city economies more difficult than what it should be. I think what we would like to see is uh, an improvement in how we collect wage data in particular. The good news is that HMRC holds all of this data already. The bad news is that it doesn't make it available, which just seems like a complete waste of public resource for that to be the case. Um, and we're hoping that actually that's going to change to some degree in the future. But it is a good point, I think, or a good juncture for me just to, to flag what we do in Chapter 1 of Cities Outlook. So today you've heard from Eleanor in terms of Chapter 2, and I've sent the, the data monitor. There's also a Chapter 1. And in that, we are using, you know, um, quite experimental real-time data to understand what is going on. So that's looking at Google data around people using public transport, about people working from home. It's around using um, football data via mobile phones to understand how people are going back to city centers. It's also about using debit and credit card spending to understand how, how spending is changing in near real time. Now that's really exciting. You know, we've, we've never really been in that position before 
at a national level, never mind a local level, to use these real-time indicators. Now, while they're not perfect, they certainly are giving you a very up-to-date picture, and it allows us to understand, you know, what is going on in a in a, sort of a situation like COVID, for example, which is having a very particular impact, but in future recessions as well, it'll give us that near up-to-date up uh, picture to understand what's going on and then what that means in terms of policy. Yeah, very good. Uh, and Eleanor, we've, we've had a few questions about uh, when you were doing your setting up the analysis that's in Outlook, several questions about um, are we updating that data uh, as and when, how frequently does that data come out and where can people find it? So just say something about, again, how we're tracking the performance through the claim account, not just providing uh, snapshots. So the report we launched was out on Monday. The latest claim and count data uh, then came out on Tuesday. So there is one more data point if we wanted uh, right now to keep tracking what's happening in terms of how hard the leveling up has become. Um, in terms of headline findings from what has happened in the latest uh, release of the data, not much has changed in the sense that uh, the claim count has slightly increased, but it's pretty much, uh, um, the, the increase hasn't been as big as in previous months. So things have pretty much stayed the same. Now, as we go through the months, uh, we will continue to track this data through our unemployment tracker, which is available online uh, on the website. So you can always find the latest claim count data for different places on the platform. Um, and then potentially in six months time, so we could uh, look back and try to see how bigger the challenge has become, um, for example, when the GRS scheme gets phased out. Yeah, very good. OK, so we've had a question. I'm going to go to Paul Stevens. Paul, if you're uh, on the call still, um, you've got a question about, I think, towards the end of what Eleanor was suggesting around how do we think about the nature of the recovery and how that's affected by the structure of different places. Paul, are you there? I am there. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, fire I'm away. Quite, I'm not quite sorted out the video, if you don't mind. <laughs> Hello there. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, really interesting. And the other day as well. Um, questions about um, places recovering from COVID. The COVID recovery won't be the same for all places. And I wonder whether you looked at how uh, a place, a city's industrial structure may affect its ability to COVID. Because I think recovery for somewhere like um, Crawley and the high claim rate there must be related to uh, Gatwick, I guess, um, how that'll be able to recover compared to um, a city like Leeds, say, which I know well, which has a slightly lesser impact from uh, COVID, but is more about the lack of people going into the city centre, I guess, and the impact on businesses there. So it's about have you looked at that impact of industrial structure? Yeah, great question. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, another Paul, Paul Greenhalgh, had, had similar questions about you know, understanding the context in which places are, you know, the way that that affects then both how they re they are uh, impacted by the economic shock, whatever it may be, but also the likelihood of their recovery. And I think we need to be very mindful when we think about policy is the second question that's as important as the first question, not only how are they being affected, but do we think they will recover and in what way and therefore what policy might be? Eleanor, why didn't you have a shot at, um, at just at, at kind of reflecting on Paul's question about industrial structure and the interaction uh, with recovery. Yes, Paul is totally right. The uh, industrial structure of different places will affect uh, how quickly and how well the places will be able to bounce back. And it is something that we looked at in the report. Uh, I touched upon it briefly in the presentation, but um, basically we can kind of think about uh, the um, impact of the pandemic it's something that is uh, has affected every place on a certain baseline level because social distancing restrictions and lockdowns that are in place means that a certain number of businesses cannot operate and that is kind of true everywhere because most of these businesses are local services businesses so if the shops the restaurants uh, um, the cafes and the hairdressers are closed that means that there is a certain level of impact uh, from the pandemic everywhere then that said on top of this baseline level a number of places have been hit particularly hard and these places can fall broadly into two categories on one hand you have places like london or like leeds as you mentioned paul uh, where probably the bigger impact of the pandemic is due to the fact that people are no longer spending time in the city center so if we think back about uh, the summer for example um, the shops and the cafes and the restaurants were open but the footfall in places like london city center uh, continue to 
to be quite low. And that was because people were working from home and they weren't going back to the office and therefore they weren't spending money on the city center. So that was having a big effect. And then on the other end, instead, we have places like Crowley or like Sluton, um, Luton or Slough, uh, that have been affected by the pandemic in a different way. Uh, their exporting base has been affected. The collapse of the international travel industry means that their exporting industry is no longer there to sustain the economic performance of the place. So when, when restrictions will be lifted, they will find themselves in a very different position as a place like London. In London, as soon as restrictions will be lifted and people will return to go back to the office, we can imagine demand for shops and cafes and restaurants in the city centre to pick up once again. So it might take them a little bit longer than places that had a lower share of jobs overall affected by the pandemic, but we are quite confident that these jobs will come back. On the other end, we are less confident that a place like Crowley or a place like Slough will be able to come back as quickly because their exporting base has been affected and that has a knock-on effect on the other services in the area. So people have lost their jobs and they're like less likely to spend in the restaurants or spend in the cafes. So yes, we have considered all these elements uh, when uh, putting the places into the different four categories. Great, thank you very much, um, Ellen. We've had we've had another question, uh, Paul, related to this. I'm going to read it out just because I just it's a it's a continuation in some respects from what Ellen have finished on London. So it's a com it's a uh, question from Ronald, and he says, "Can you comment on the big elephant in the room?" I haven't seen that one yet, but um, great presentations today. But are they reflecting the fact that in 2020, Greater London lost 300,000 people and counting? And this obviously refers to the some of the research that Jonathan Portas and colleagues have done, which is looking at the, you know, the sense that people have left the country. Uh, we can get into the debate as to why they've left. Uh, but there's, there's that. And obviously that relates to the bigger question, which is about, is it the end of big cities because we're all going to be living at home? Uh, and what does that mean for our places? Because we've had several questions on that. So tie all that up together uh, in terms of a commentary on the future of our big cities and the degree to which working from home will fundamentally undermine them uh, over the next decade. Lovely. And I'm going to throw something else in just to quickly answer the question before as well, is that Alan has set out, you know, what was going on from a from an industrial structure perspective or what is going on and what that means for policy. I'm going to run around HMRC again because we don't have the sector data. HMRC does have it. And actually today it released at the regional level on sectors, but they're not doing it at local authority levels. If we had that data, we could make even greater insights. But just to blow our own trumpet sort of very slightly, I'm very proud with an outlook of what we actually did with this, is that we're able to make a number of assumptions with the data that we have in order to bring out those insights, even though we haven't actually got the data there. And that was the chart that Alan showed, which was a quadrant in the presentation. Please do and have a, have a look at it because it helps us to make those four categories of cities, which I think is going to be really helpful for policy colleagues, or I certainly hope so, and that's why we did it. In terms of people leaving London, the end of the big cities. So the short answer in terms of, you know, did we, do we look at how populations have declined in London? No, we haven't. Um, the work that uh, John Potter and co have done is, is very important. It's only just being done, and we haven't got any official data as yet in terms of what's happened to populations. Again, there's an issue there about how quickly we can, can measure things and how quickly we can respond as a, um, as a society to some of these trends. But in terms of whether we then think that this is going to be any knock on impact in terms of the decline of, of, of big cities in particular in the future, post COVID, we're much more sceptical about this. This is exactly the, the topic that chapter one of Cities Outlook has a look at and uses this real time data to understand. Now, you know, Eleanor has presented the economic impact of COVID, but in terms of how people live their lives, you know, what impact has COVID had across the country? And what we see is generally a lot of places across the country have bounced back, apart from the city centres of our big cities, which still remain to be like ghost towns, you know, since, the, since people emptied out at the, the, the latter end of, of March. Now, that's a big challenge for them. The question then is, well, are people ever going to come back because we all work from home now? Well, there are a number of reasons why we think that is not the case. Um, one is that face-to-face -face interaction is really, really important. So, you know, we're doing this presentation now via Zoom, but I guarantee you it would be even better if we were all in the same room together. And it's the ability to have those face-to-face -face interactions with colleagues, share information, share ideas, and especially for new colleagues too. And anyone who's, who's trying to integrate somebody via Zoom rather than integrate them in an office, 
that's much more difficult to do. And it's much more difficult for them too, to also learn about not only how the organization works, but also about learning on the job too and picking up those skills because you all work in your own little cells now and you miss lots of information. The second point is, you know, cities have existed for a very, very long time, 6,000 years. They've, they've always been places of, uh, of disease and yet they've always bounced back, you know, not always straight away, but have bounced back in the longer term because we, we come up with new inventions. Um, sewers in Victorian London was a response to very poor quality water, which was causing cholera. And we came up, we, we engineered a new solution for that. The third point to this, and this is the point we make in, in chapter one, which I think is a fairly new point, certainly in terms of bringing data to bear at least, is that this is not the first time that cities in East Asia have dealt with something like this. You know, we think about it as the first time we've dealt with it in our lifetime and therefore cities are going to import. And yet, you know, big cities in East Asia have dealt with bird flu, avian flu, SARS, and the risk of, of pandemics, you know, since the turn of the century. And yet what we see in every city and every country, sorry, in East Asia, is that their share of residents who live in urban areas increased since 2000. Actually, in some places, has increased by a very fast rate too. So I think pulling all of this data together, we should be hopeful that COVID is not going to change the demand for face-to-face -face interaction once hopefully we do have a vaccine which is able to um, both be administered and is robust to any future changes in, uh, in strains. Um, once that's done, we think the demand for that face-to-face -face interaction will rise again and we will see the centres of our biggest cities actually come, return to be hives of activity once more. Great, thank you very much. Uh... Paul, you know, good to, to look elsewhere for to, to understand how other places over time have responded and what that might tell us. As Paul said, we're, fa we're fairly confident, uh, you know, that our cities will survive and thrive. They'll adapt and change. They won't necessarily be the same, uh, but they still will be in, in existence. We may well uh, be wrong, but I'm fairly confident that we you know that we won't be uh, i am skeptical of people who are definitive for example who claim that you know everybody's going to be working from home and they're very clear on that i think anybody that is that uh, certain of what uh, the the next phase is i think i would treat them with a bit of uh, a bit of caution but that's just um uh, j just me um eleanor again we're going to jump around but there's a question about that came in uh i'm trying to find it yeah from hannah or hannah hock Hannah, if you're on the call, if you're there, it's a great question, it's quite long, but you're asking about, you know, the role of, you know, some of the industries that have been really fundamentally hit, hospitality, leisure, retail, they're often kind of the entry level uh, jobs into the economy for youngsters. So just, just say something about that and I get Eleanor to think about, because that connects to our kind of job creation and skills uh, investment, etc. Hannah, over to you. Yeah, yeah, so as I say, it was your slide on the recovery that really sort of struck me about this because um, the solutions were quite traditional solutions, but we know that young people have been particularly hit in terms of the job losses. And as I say, the tradition, traditionally, retail and hospitality are the entry level for, for jobs. Now, hospitality, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I take what you're saying about people will come back I'm slightly skeptical on that. However, retail has had a long, long, long um, term decline, and that seems to have massively accelerated. And there's no sign that that's coming back. So sort of traditional voucher schemes or whatever to encourage people to shop on the high street may not actually do the job do we have a different way of, of looking at you know how we actually get high streets working and you know doing something different and do we have different strategies for getting young people into jobs brilliant excellent great question uh eleanor un unpick and unpack that yeah i think that's a that's a great question on um in terms of uh, um, what's happening for young people. Um, obviously, the closure of hospitality and retail uh, plays a very negative role on their first step in their career ladder. And that is an incredibly difficult position to be in, especially if you're a young person in that position right now. Um, the decline of the retail industry, as you said, is not new. It's something that has been uh, going on for uh, a few years now. And it's something that we had analyzed in previous 
previous work as well uh, when looking at the future of work and it is definitely a sector that will go through uh, quite significant changes in the, uh, in the next few years. So in terms of job opportunities for people it might not be a sector um, that uh, will provide as many as opportunities uh, that he uh, currently did or he did before the pandemic. In terms of the recommendations that we talked about in the report, we focused more um, in the recommendation I talk about in the presentation, I talk about ways to prevent more people to lose their jobs, and that is important. But um, among the recommendations that we have in Outlook, we also do recognize how uh, difficult it can be for people who have lost their jobs right now to try and find new jobs. Because if your all uh, work experience is that in retail or in hospitality, it might be extremely hard for you right now to uh, manage and jump in a completely different sector. Now, the government uh, kickstart scheme, for example, will help more young people to find uh, um, entry level opportunities in other sectors, and that's really important. Important, but we also need uh, for people who already left compulsory education and who are in the labor market a number of retraining opportunities to help them transition to different sectors. And then alongside that, especially in the medium short term, when it is really hard to find jobs right now because there's not many jobs opportunities available, there's also um, a task for the government to create job opportunities that are if you want to call them that way, ready-made, like green jobs. We talk about a lot about green jobs and it's been one of the government's commitment in its manifesto. So if we could create these jobs and make them available, that would provide alternative routes into the labor market for people who have lost their jobs. Great, excellent, thank you very much. Um, I wanna keep uh, pushing on, because a couple of other questions that uh, we've got in I want to, uh, want to explore. We've had, um, uh, just to add another complicating factor into what was already a complicated picture. We've had several questions uh, on the issue of Brexit uh, and sort of two elements to the questions. I'm gonna paraphrase them. So Chloe and Austin and Gareth amongst others asked the questions about Brexit. Two, so two aspects of it. One, did we include uh, an analysis of how Brexit might affect um, what well, cities are currently going on where they will be in outlook itself one secondly have we done any work that looks at how brexit might affect um the uh the, our cities and towns so paul do you want to start on that so you know was it in outlook's analysis have we done any analysis on it so it's not in outlook analysis they were very deliberately focused on trying to understand how levelling up and COVID interact with one another. But of course, the third big challenge that the government faces is about how Brexit will play out across the country. We have done work on this before, and we did it in partnership with the Centre for Economic Performance at the LSE um, about two years ago to understand how different types of Brexit deal might have an impact um, across the country. Um, we did two scenarios. One was a, a hard Brexit, which was no trade deal at all. Um, the second one was a, was a softer scenario, which is actually pretty close to what we ended up with, which is um, no uh, restrictions in terms of trading of goods um, or tariffs on goods, but actually maybe some, sort of, uh, uh, some friction in terms of the way that we trade services. Now, what's interesting to think about the current Brexit deal, which actually makes it a bit more difficult to pin down what impact we might see is that there's a lot of stuff that still hasn't been sorted out around services. We've heard quite a lot about financial services in particular and how there's still a number of things to set out. So you know, something was announced in December, but actually there's a lot of loose ends still to tie up and we don't know exactly how that's going to um, play out. But if we take the scenario that we did in, in, our, in our work with the LSC, what that showed was that everywhere would be affected, would see a, would a negative impact, although clearly it'd be less in, a, in the current deal than what it would be if we had no deal at all. Um, but the second thing is that in terms of the geography, it looks like actually it'll impact, certainly in the short term at least, places further south more than places further north. Now, the reason for that is because the makeup of what cities in the south export tends to be more reliant on services, which are going to be affected by, um, by not being part of the single market, whereas uh, exports further north tend to be more based on goods, where it looks as if we're, we're close notwithstanding issues around rules of origin we're close to what we um to what we had in a in a single market deal as as well so that's how we think that play out in the short term the longer term obviously is something very different we don't really know how it's going to um influence sort of patterns of investment into the uk 
And if we've seen patterns of investment further north in more manufacturing type activities, which are doing that in order to get access to, to the single market, such as um, car manufacture, for example, it's not clear about how the current deal then starts to change that. Um, and so that's where I think clearly why there seems to be a sort of a south north divide in terms of the early stages impact of the deal. It's not clear as whether that might flip in the longer term. Brilliant. Excellent. OK, let's keep pushing on. I've got at least two uh, more subjects I just want to touch on. Um, Kevin, if you're still on the call, you just posted a question. Others have asked it, so I'm going to come to you in a second about devolution and powers. But you can tell the audience that we've got we've all had several questions, which I love. But there we are uh, around the census, uh, which is obviously due in 2021. Uh, uh, and classically, you know, we've had one question is, you know, given what's happening, will the census be a complete waste of time? Uh, or on the other hand, you know, we've had a question which is census 2021 isn't that perfect timing to understand all what's going on. Uh, Eleanor, give us your thought on that. You know, census, is it now or never, as it were, and is it going to be any good? Well, it is definitely a unique opportunity to understand in the very details what has happened in the last few months. But then overall, if we think about what the purpose of the census is, and is to track the change over time, and that's why we have it every, every 10 years, some of the questions in this year's census will be affected by the pandemic in a way that is representative of the months and the, and, and, the, and the events that we're going through right now, but they're not hopefully representative of the next decade or the, the 10 years. Um, so um, in that sense, uh, there will be a number of uh, downsides uh, to this year's uh, census. And the other thing to consider with the census is that while it is great and it provides great details, uh, about uh, different uh, local areas uh, in a way that we don't have in any other um, data available. Um, it lacks 10 years time. So right now we're doing analysis with data from the 2011 census. The new census will be available in a, in a year or two or so. And, uh, and so uh, while it's still an important representation of reality, it's not the most timely one that we have. So we need to complement it with other data sets. Yeah, no, it's very good. We get very excited about the, the census. But it's, again, as you say, just reminding that the local level uh, analysis and data that comes out, you know, we are waiting uh, at least a good few years for that to come out. Uh, it's good for the historical analysis, but not for giving us a commentary on uh, the here and the uh, here and the now. So very good points on that. Um, uh, question on this is probably the last question. Kevin, if you're still on the call, Kevin, um, you are fantastic. Ask your question. Yeah, I was struck on the conversation on Monday. A lot of it turned to devolution and uh, pressing uh, for more devolution and more powers to come. And I noticed Jesse Norman didn't answer the question about his levelling up. What is the definition of levelling up? Um, so my question really is, given the levelling up challenge and the COVID challenge together, are there other particular powers, are there controls of other particular budgets that really should come into the equation, should come into the white paper, when it eventually emerges later this year. Brilliant, thank you very much indeed, uh, Kevin. Uh, Paul, why didn't you ever bash it, mm. uh, bash at that? Well, we've already got lots of ideas for what should go into the white paper. So whether we should try crowbar some more and as a result of COVID, maybe we'll be too greedy. Um, the most serious is that I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's anything in particular that um, that COVID brings up that you would then add an extra. I think it probably exposes some of the weaknesses that we've got in the system already. But these weaknesses have been in place for many decades and that's why you know, the, the, the A paper on devolution that the government may or may not have, have promised is going to be very important. What we'd like to see in that is uh, we want to see uh, places levelled up to London. London has had powers for 20 years now up to that other places have not benefited from. London is our strongest performing city. Why are we not extending that, therefore, to other places? And we want to see local authorities have greater freedom and flexibility about how they spend their money as well. Because I'm sure many people on the call will know, but not everybody knows, is that local authorities get budgets on a yearly basis. They have to spend that money within a year, and it's very difficult for them to just try and sort of save some of that and plan over multi-year periods, which is, you know, it's, it's treating uh, local authorities like the kindergarten children rather than, you know, serious bodies that deliver, you know, public services at the local level in our arm of government. That needs to change. So it's those two elements. But I think the trade-off with that is that we can't expect to pass all these extra powers down and not do something like institutional capacity within local government. Because not only is local government 
pretty weak compared to other parts of the world in terms of how many powers it holds. But we then do something weird in that we sort of take that very limited power and then chop it up into lots more little pieces you know, over, um, over the areas that people live and work their lives over. So an example of that in Nottingham, for example, to take an extreme example, is that there are nine local authorities of county and, and lower tier that are responsible for the city of Nottingham in terms of its build-up area. Nine. That's nine different chief executives, nine different leaders, nine different transport plans, nine different whatever else it is, which just doesn't really seem like it's a great way to, for local government to make the most of the powers that it has, never mind the stuff that comes down. And so we've got to have that institutional capacity there in order to be able to receive those extra powers that we want to see. And that's why we then need to have local government reorganisation on top of that. Let's say, I don't think COVID changes that. I just think COVID probably illustrates and emphasises sort of how much of a problem that has been. Very good. So having raised another deeply contentious issue, now is the perfect time to, to call it a day uh, and bring the session uh, to an end. It's one o'clock. Uh, we could go on, but unfortunately um, we can't. Um, I hope that's been useful to people get under the skin of what we were talking about briefly on, on Monday, provides you a bit more of an insight about how we think about or how we thought about what we were trying to do as well as what we actually did. You can find all the details about uh, Cities Outlook 21, the report, the data, the tool, the blogs, the videos, it's all there on our website, centreforcities.org forward slash cities um, outlook. Um, as Paul was showing you, have a play around with the city monitor and um, come back and tell us what you think, things, how it could be improved or things you'd like to see it being able to do. That would be um, hugely helpful as well. Um, my thanks to Paul and Eleanor in taking us through all of that. Uh, thanks to you for joining and for your questions. Um, our next event actually nicely leads on from some of these issues today is on the 11th of Feb. It's with the policy at Manchester um, and it's really looking at the challenges and opportunities about how we ensure that our local leaders get access to the data and the analysis they need, they need in order to make the decisions that they need to make in terms of dealing with uh, the impact of COVID, whether it's on a health front or whether it's on a uh, on the economy front as well. So a nice kind of flow on from some of the issues that we've uh, we've raised today. So hopefully see you all at that event on the uh, 11th of uh, February. Uh, but until then, thank you all for being here. Take care and stay safe.